Дорогие друзья, сегодня вас... Dear friends, today I invite you to talk with an interesting person, Viktor Alexeyevich Efimov, the person who, from my point of view, can give unique advice to a top entrepreneur of any age, of any level of the company. I'm very glad that today he agreed to talk with us. Я очень рад, что сегодня он согласился с нами. Виктор Алексеевич, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Виктор Алексеевич, можно сходу... Виктор Алексеевич, can we get to the point straight away? Judging by what you say, you believe in predestination. Every person has a sufficiently wide range of possibilities, and he is the master of his own destiny. It is precisely he who chooses his path. Besides, he does it weekly, daily, hourly, and in an online mode, I would say. Therefore, I am not a supporter of fatalism, but we all have everything rigidly inscribed. That destiny is predetermined, and in this sense the predetermination is formed, and all that remains is to follow in the fairway. I am convinced that we shape our destiny exclusively ourselves. This fairway you are talking about, is it somehow set in advance for entrepreneurs and businessmen, or not? In my opinion, the main vector is set, first of all, no matter how banally strange it may seem, by the spiritual and obvious parameters of a person if we are talking about a long-term strategy. In a short period, you can achieve phenomenal success. But if we talk about a lifelong path, then this is determined by how the vector of life objectives of a person is set how he correlates his understanding of life with God, with the highest design. These words for me are far from an empty phrase, although perhaps 25 to 30 years ago, I did not put serious meaning into these words. Now I look at life completely differently, and in many ways, in my opinion, the destiny of a person is determined by how much he feels, senses, the stream of God's providence. And as much as possible, in the situation that has been formed today, nonetheless, despite many sometimes obvious things, one has to follow the stream of God's providence. Sometimes this is not the easiest path, I would say so. A person can build his destiny according to his own interests with such elements of demonism as, so I will make my destiny like this, I will organize my life like that, or he can simply rely on God's providence. He can take this stance and say, God, I give my life into your hands. I entrust my life, first of all, to you, God, because you know better what I need than I do. And a person tries to feel this stream every second and build his destiny no longer the way he himself would like, but in accordance with certain prompts from above. Of course, it takes years for this algorithmics to take shape. So, if there are these prompts from above, are they in a certain, properly pre-thought-out stream? The stream of God's providence is always present, but a person may build his own perspectives, plans in business, family life, either in accordance with the stream of God's providence, or believing that there is no providence, that his destiny is in only his hands but not in God's. And on this basis he will act to achieve the result, not trying to pose questions and receive answers to them, questions such as, are these plans and perspectives in agreement with God's providence? Is it in accordance with God's providence or not to act like this? This is what I mean. Now, if a person thinks and checks his course with the Creator every day, if he thinks about the variance of how to act in a given situation, which are very specific questions, moreover, these are not questions of God, these are his personal questions, but he verifies it in the following way, is this in accordance with God, or is it not in accordance with God? Then a person resides in the stream of providence. Entrepreneurs say that they often make decisions intuitively, based on their inner feelings, just as they intuitively decide whether to enter the path of this entrepreneurial activity or not. Where do you think this feeling is? Which tells me whether I am doing the right thing entering this path of entrepreneurship or not. When you mentioned intuitive feelings, this is, I believe, the most important thing. We must understand what it is, because, generally speaking, from the moment of birth, a person goes through four levels, if not correlated with some kind of classical psychology, 
but correlated with how we ourselves understand life. Literally, from birth, we go through four stages. The animal type of psyche structure, when a person is governed only by instincts. The next level, we call the level of the zombie bio-robot, when a person tries to do everything the way everyone else does. For instance, a child. I want to do it like my dad. I want to do it like my mom. The next, third level, we call the demonic type of psyche structure, when the child no longer wants to be like his mom or dad, and he already moves to the position, I want to do it the way I want to do it. That is, a child, or an entrepreneur, puts himself in the center of creation. He believes that he is the navel of the earth, and so he will decide everything about how to be, and who to be, and so on. And only the fourth level, when he has already got himself into trouble, burnt himself once or twice, only after this bitter experience does he begin to think, how did it come to this? I planned everything, but it didn't work out here, it didn't work out there. After that he begins to understand that as it turns out there is something above us. There is something we call the highest providence, God, Creator or Almighty. And these are not just some mystical words, an element of religious belief, it is an element of completely concrete, practical actions and doings. The one who postulated this for himself and understood that this exists, he simply begins to live a different life. He consults with the highest providence every day. This is called intuitive insights or prompts of the soul. But it's important that they come from God and not from egregors of egoism egregors of greed, egregors of acquiring wealth, and so on. This is a very thin border. So when a person has an intuitive signal prompting him on how to act, it is important to understand where exactly this is coming from. This is determined by the nervousness of the person. When a person nevertheless takes this path and says, my destiny is entrepreneurship, what do you think he should fail? When I talk about the stream of God's providence, intuitive insights, life prompts, a person should feel peace in his soul, calmness, self-confidence, and a person's actions should be accomplished with a smile on his face. The first sign of a person's connection with God is a smile on the face. If he does things with joy, with a smile, then everything is fine. But if everything goes wrong, then he needs to stop and think. For example, I have the most important litmus test. This is the tuning of my soul. So in harmony with God, a person feels a specific abundant grace, which can be characterized with the Russian word blago. Even if he is pushed this by the hardship of events that are happening to him, so they tell him, you have to maintain yourself financially, so go and make money. Yes, despite the circumstances that are developing around. Sometimes it may seem to him that the given situation is much worse, because he thinks that now he could be in a different situation, earning more. But you see, unlike God, we cannot calculate, as in Bulgakov's novel The Master and Margarita, even for a thousand years, because in order to govern, one must be able to prognose. Remember, there is that episode in the book with the following words. How can man govern? if he is not only deprived of the opportunity of making a plan for at least some ridiculously short period, well, say, a thousand years, but cannot even vouch for his own tomorrow. Unfortunately, a person is not endowed with such qualities, therefore a person cannot rely only on himself. If he feels he needs to act in a certain way, if a person likes and feels it right according to his soul, then he needs to act so. Because it may be, that another part a slew of advisors offer you today, as the most preferable, will lead you nowhere in a year. In our difficult time, it's rather difficult to predict. We have several concepts that are similar, close to each other, but nevertheless not exactly the same, or not at all the same. Here is the concept of businessman, the concept of entrepreneur, and the concept of leader. Where is the difference, and where are the transitions from one to another? The issue of terminology is a very important issue. I'll remind you about Pushkin, because Pushkin very clearly distinguished between barin and landlord. 
Do you feel the difference? As you name a ship, so will it sail. For me, the most sacred word when we talk about entrepreneurship, business, is the ordinary Russian word upravlenie, which means governance, because it has the same root prav as the Russian words pravda, truth, pravidnost, spravedlivost, praviousness. Therefore, governance, upravlenie, in my opinion, is the most beautiful word. The word entrepreneur, which means take actions, undertake a project, in my opinion, is also a very serious word, which obliges a person to a lot, and which contains such previous energetics. And I would like to advise all entrepreneurs to pay attention to such subtle nuance in different terms. What do people usually wish? They often wish good luck, right? Well, luck is when a person wins something, or he is given something, so he is lucky. That is, a person cannot build his destiny on luck. Happiness, this for me is understandable. It is very important for an entrepreneur. In Russian, the main content of the word счастье, happiness, where с means with and chast means part, is that a person should really feel himself to be a part of some process, collective, great cause or mission. So when you are part of this, then you have true happiness in the Russian sense of the word. But as soon as a person becomes individualized from the collective, when the entrepreneur begins to clearly separate, this is me and this is them, and I govern them all, he must understand that he can only be truly happy with other people. I think we will not explain every word in detail, but if we look carefully at the etymology of words we use in our language, then an entrepreneur can learn a lot and pick up previous words for himself in business. Often, people passing from the state of a leader, an employee, and into the state of an entrepreneur, the owner of a company, do not fully realize what state they are moving into. Could you give some advice to people who are really moving from being an employee to being an owner, governor, entrepreneur? Undoubtedly, this is a step of great responsibility. But nonetheless, as far as human relations are concerned, it is very important not to change yourself. I have some experience, and this is primarily associated with the years I have lived, of course. In Eastern teachings, it is believed that a person can call himself a teacher, or someone can call him a teacher, only after the age of 75 years. So it's too early for me to claim the status of teacher. But nonetheless, I had some experience in different ways, since I've been through different spheres of life, such as my destiny. I began my life as a military man. I was an officer serving in the far north, and there I witnessed an experience that served as a lesson for my whole life. We had a team of officers, we were all friends. I was a lieutenant, the rest were lieutenants. And then one day, one of us received a third star. He became a senior lieutenant. Well, naturally, nothing special had happened, right? But when the next day, he entered in new shoulder straps, he entered with a completely different look, with a completely different posture. Well, we all stood up to greet, and he said, sit down, comrades, sit. That is to say, it's important that this does not happen when a person, having received a certain prefix or having received a certain property into his hands, does not hold himself in high regard, that he is now completely different, that he has changed, that now it is no longer possible to talk to him as previously, that he has already become much smarter overnight. This, as it seems to me, is the most dangerous. And this spoils many people, the people who connect their personal eye with certain attributes. They become candidates of sciences, owners of something big, or yesterday they bought some shares, for instance. Yesterday you communicated with these people on the same level, but now they are already different people. This, in my opinion, hits people's authority very hard. Therefore, I believe that when being promoted, this primarily implies responsibility. And the one who has been promoted should be able to remain a human and preserve all human contacts that he has built. You know, I often talk to businessmen and always ask them, tell me, 
What is still the most precious, most valuable in life? All sorts of reasoning begins. Many, of course, answer that this is money and material and financial wealth. But after short conversations, most, if not all, without exception, agree that the most precious thing in life is connections and relationships between people. So, if there are connections and relationships, you will always have money. And vice versa, if there are no connections and relationships, then with a lot of money, you may end up behind bars or somewhere else. Therefore, with all changes in life, it is necessary to preserve this first of all, relations with people, and not only with bosses or someone higher ranking. It should be noted that many break their fate precisely on the inability to build relationships with people who are below them. As soon as those who are below are looked down on as if they are not the people who those higher see as worthy of dealing with, building relationships with, this is already the first step in the wrong direction. In my opinion, these are the most important points. From your point of view, what objective does an entrepreneur have? It should be noted that entrepreneurship is also an ability to ensure a financial result, because this is ultimately a litmus test of the entrepreneur's consistency or inconsistency. But if we talk about the vector of a person's objectives, then money should not be in the first place. So if he puts the financial result, money and maximum profit in his vector of objectives in the first place when making any decision, then sooner or later he will lose. In order to make money, he must first of all live according to God's design. Living divinely or according to God is probably a subject for a separate discussion. But in a nutshell, it is very simple. Living divinely means not doing harm to oneself. Now, if a person harms himself through alcohol, tobacco, and so on, this means that he is already out of the stream of God's providence, because God helps those who help themselves. If a person doesn't care about his own destiny, then God will no longer help him. Therefore, the first principle is not to harm oneself. The second principle is to not harm those around us. The third principle is to not harm creation. And if you are guided by these principles, then in the long term, from my experience, from my practice, you will earn much more than someone who is aimed only at money. I'm talking about what every person should verify with in terms of everyday decisions that he makes. I'm talking about the foundation, on the basis of which he verifies hundreds of his particular decisions. But, of course, in order to continue doing business, implementing entrepreneurship schemes, a person needs to be a truly competent governor. He needs to understand what governance is. Because, unfortunately, in classical science today, there are no clear ideas and concepts about what governance is. And in this sense, we have free access to all information, including information that has been stored for centuries in clan initiation systems, it is open today. So the materials of the conception of social safety contain a whole course, which is called the Sufficiently General Theory of Governance. I recommend it to all entrepreneurs who orient themselves towards long-term perspectives. They need to study and understand the sufficiently general theory of governance in every detail. I would say that even state-level governors should mature precisely from the entrepreneurial environment. And for this, they must be competent governors at the very beginning. It is just that our education system is such that it does not give an idea of the processes of governance as such. Actually, the sufficiently general theory of governance gives certain recipes, ideas and concepts about processes of governance in general, which can be applied to particular processes a person deals with. If we turn to the words of Shakespeare, then we will see that he says the following, Of government, the properties to unfold, would seem in me to affect speech and discourse. So what does governance begin with? Governance starts with the formation of an objective. This is where governance begins. Set out in the sufficiently general theory of governance is the entire function of governance, which contains seven stages. First of all, a person needs to detect the environmental factor that hinders him. For example, 
there is no money or something else. Then he should learn to recognize this factor in the future. Next, he should build a vector of objectives. And after the vector of objectives is completely clear to him, he needs to form a conception for achieving the objective and only then to create a structure for this conception. For example, a person determines the environment and the objective for himself. From your point of view, what objective might be previous for an entrepreneur? The objectives should be those that work against a factor that interferes with life in full abundance. Today, a person sees that life is not built in a previous way, that today we do not have this or that opportunity. We, for example, do not have the opportunity to eat healthy, wholesome food. That is to say, entrepreneurs should use as a starting point a certain need that society has. And when they definitely see this need and see that this is what society needs today, then after they have discerned and recognized this pressing factor, they form objectives. For example, I feel the need to start raising rabbits, not because after calculations it turns out that this is more economically profitable than other variants under consideration, but because in my inner world the sense has arisen that this is what society really needs. It turns out that an entrepreneur is a player in a confrontation. There is something that interferes and something has to be opposed to this. I would not say that this is a confrontation. If we speak in positive terms, it is rather like we would like to arrange the life of society for the better. A person must find that stream that will help this current of life towards the better. Of course, there are different kinds of interfering factors, but he should start from the positive, not fight against something, but create. Because the most dangerous thing in life of an entrepreneur and a politician is to fight against something. As soon as we begin to struggle, fight against something, then we strengthen what we are struggling against. That is, any criticism, any exposure, any struggle, ultimately work for the egregor of evil. Therefore, you just need to form your own field. Yes, there are some things that don't suit us, but we don't have to go into the field that doesn't suit us. We need to create our own field, where people will come from the previous one, which doesn't suit them. This means that a person should see something that can give people more privacy usefulness development. A person has to see that this is necessary for people, that they have some kind of need for it. Well, I think we won't open any new discoveries on America here. Here I want to recommend the books of Henry Ford. They are very useful for aspiring entrepreneurs. There you can learn a lot of useful things. In particular, Ford says that money should follow a core business that is objectively useful for society. So if you do useful things, then money will come to you. But if you put money in the foreground, then not everything may be smooth with your profit. Therefore, one needs to really see the problems that exist in society, to catch the resonance that arises in the soul for this or that problem, for this or that opportunity. One has one kind of possibility or opportunity, another has other opportunities. One has one experience, another has another experience. So, in accordance with what we experience, a person needs to see what he can do for society, which will certainly be interesting, in demand and useful, and which hardly anyone will do better than him. Because, for example, he has the necessary experience for this, the necessary upbringing and education and so on. That is, he has to see what he can do for society, taking into account his life and even all sorts of little things that sometimes would not seem very fundamental. There can be some contacts, some acquaintances, in order to see what is definitely necessary for society today. Quite a lot of leaders, entrepreneurs, owners of companies of completely different levels come to you with their questions. What do you think at the moment? What is the main problem within entrepreneurship, within business? What do people not fully understand? 
One of the most important questions in the entrepreneurial environment is the question related to the fact that if you lay claims to govern a system, hundreds of people, structures, then you should at least clearly understand that you should govern over yourself. Many governors do not realize that they themselves are hostages of certain alien structures of governance. They believe that it's their own choice and that they themselves make this decision and everything in relation to themselves personally. I'll tell you that I had an experience with very serious entrepreneurs, candidates of science. So I failed to prove to one of them that smoking is not his choice, but is the method of how he is governed. He was foaming at the mouth, saying, you are telling me nonsense. As for smoking, this is my personal choice. No one has ever influenced me. I made the decision myself and no one told me to start. I could decide to smoke, but could decide not to smoke. This is a sign of non-understanding of the most elementary and very simple things. This year, I have published a book called Global Governance and Man, How to Get Out of the Matrix. I would like to recommend everyone at least to understand the title of this book and at least to look into something within it. The fact is that we all live in a matrix and when we make a decision, this decision is already prepared in advance. Those structures that sell tobacco, alcohol, in contrast to an entrepreneur, already have centuries-long experience in working with human souls. Starting from childhood, a matrix is formed. The child sees pictures, hears words, sees how his parents celebrate holidays and much, much more. And then at the age of 17, 18, a person makes his own decision. But this own decision has nothing to do with what is in a person from God, with what a person could do based on his willpower, if it were not for these egregorial matrix guidances. Therefore, the most important thing is to start by understanding what governance over oneself is, what is mastery of oneself. And this, first of all, means to consider those factors that hinder effective work. But if we talk about very simple things, this is alcohol and tobacco, as these are tools of governance. One of the chapters in my book is titled Alcohol and Tobacco in the System of Global Governance over Humanity. If a person does not detect, recognize these as tools of governance, then he is worthless as a governor. This is very simple, but a person does not understand it. He thinks this was created just for happiness. If he detects and recognizes these factors, then he needs to build his own behavior and his own vector of objectives in accordance with the detected and recognized factors. Whether he wants to live beautifully and happily for three days or six months or a year, or enter his 70th birthday in a good mood with good health, it is necessary to decide what is the objective. When we proclaim in all charters that the main objective of the created structure, the created enterprise, is profit, this is a very profound mistake, an ideological worldview error. I can tell you, when corporations were created, even in the nascent United States, no one would ever register a company charter until it was shown what social need this corporation was being created for. What's more, one would never be allowed to work if, for example, one had somehow come into contact with politics. This is where business actually started, and many in their inner world have this understanding today. Global huge earnings sooner or later end badly. You most likely also have enough examples, but I have dozens or even hundreds of examples of very, on the one hand, successful businessmen, entrepreneurs, who make millions and billions, but they are unhappy in life, failed in family life and have no children. These people also failed to build relationships with others. I think I have more negative examples in this sense than those where I can name a very rich person who is happy in life. I have more negative ones where a person lives in his stereotype. In his circles, he walks with his head held up high. After all, he needs to console himself with something. 
Everyone grovels before such a person, bows, runs around him, fusses about. He is a billionaire. But one can't talk to him, as they say, heart to heart. I've talked to people like this. I tell them, well, how can you live like this? Give it all up. They answer me, I can't. Only when I'm dead, I can. No one will let me out. I'm responsible for all the money in the business. Everything is on me. Therefore, I would not recommend starting out entrepreneurs to envision themselves in excess, but to see themselves primarily as a happy person with a happy family, with strong in reason, dobrious children, to live and co-measure their doings with God's providence. Speaking of Alexander Pushkin, he had a mentor who was his role model in literature. This was Gavril Dirjavin. So Dirjavin, in my opinion, very wisely spoke about this. My wish is to surrender, to Almighty God my destiny, to chase not after worldly pleasure, but search for happiness in me, in health, in sovest pravius, in wealth of honor dobrius, I am made happier than kings. I would add billionaires. I am made happier than billionaires. It is not billionaires who are happy, but those people are happy who live in wealth of honor dobrius, as Dirjavan says. Excessiveness has never made anyone happy. Do you think that at the moment, entrepreneurs can change the first clause of their charter? I think that sometimes we should not believe what is written in papers. In the end, happiness is not in the papers. The main thing is what is written in one's soul. Today, it is customary to draw up a charter, a change in which may be caused by the non-understanding of partners, shareholders. Of course, I would welcome it if at least one entrepreneur, the owner of his business, wrote that his main objective is not to make money, but the main objective is to do blago for people in the expectation that money will come. Nonetheless, the most important thing is how a person arranges and builds his life. If he lives in accordance with Dirjavan's commandments, then his life as a human with a capital H will ultimately come to be, and he will be a truly happy person. I remember you talking about the fact that it is better to take into a team the people whose world understanding and worldview are, if not the same, then close to yours. First of all, in my opinion, this is a question of nerviousness. A person needs to take a closer look, understand, maybe even go through something with other people. Only after which, unfortunately, something is revealed. But if nerviousness is different, then people not understanding why, concerning the same issue, question, will have different opinions, although their own correct position on the question seems obvious to each of them. Well, often in the team they say, I need different opinions. It is very important that within the same nerviousness there are different opinions, but when these opinions are different on nervous grounds, then there will be no consensus. So, it turns out that you need to reject such employees. I would not say that you need to reject people. People change very quickly under the influence of the corporate culture. It is easiest to change a person in such conditions, to write everyone off on the basis of Ravius or some other unsuitability is the easiest way. The most important thing is to form a corporate culture. If the corporate culture is formed, then a person changes and changes very quickly. A year or two and you simply won't recognize him. In my opinion, it is necessary to form a collective under some serious banner, understandable to everyone applying for a job in this collective. Just recently, very expensive research was carried out in the city of Penza on the theme of how to achieve the maximum productivity of the collective, that is, how to create the most effective team. This is exactly the question you are asking me. And after these expensive studies, they came to the conclusion that the main problem arising in the collective or team is related to the imbalance of the vectors of objectives of a particular employee, department, team, ministry as a whole, and, in the end, humanity as a whole. Today, such a task, in particular, has also been put before me by a company to help them develop a system that would optimize the vectors of employees' objectives so that a person who has just joined this company 
could see his life and his objectives in line with what the company does. If this is not the case, then sooner or later things in the company will somehow not work out. Therefore, the main thing is not so much to reject people according to the aforementioned principle, but to try, through the development of corporate culture, through a clear explanation of objectives to each and every one of the employees of the company, to form unity. The main thing is that one has to grow a successor of oneself. The idea of cultivating a successor of oneself should permeate all echelons of the structure of leaders. This should be encouraged, and people who are cultivating a successor of themselves should be encouraged by the company. And it should be that if you have managed to cultivate a successor of yourself, that you should have the opportunity to be promoted. But it should not be such that once you have cultivated a successor of yourself, you are then removed. This is the spirit of caring for people. People need to feel the prospects for growth, promotion. This is a kind of corporate spirit that really creates an atmosphere where people strive to grow. If you had an opportunity to return to your age of 25 using a time machine, I mean to the time you studied as an active leader, as a governor, what advice would you give to yourself? You see, I simply have a specific destiny. So if we rewind as much as you say, to my younger age at that time, I was the head of a city level, the secretary of the Leningrad City Party Committee, and undoubtedly, a nationwide prospect opened up for me. It was obvious to everyone. I was the youngest in age, I was not yet 40. The article, What Comes After Perestroika, was written in the newspaper Central Pravda. Then a couple of times, I was offered, through the same variant, to enter the federal level. At that time, I did not consider it possible for myself, because it was contrary to my Naravia's principles. It was planned that I would become the second Yeltsin, or something similar, which was against my Naravia'sness. But if we talk about today's experience, then I would say that with today's understanding, I might not have refused. Why? Very unfortunately, in the situation in which we live, sometimes it's necessary to work as agents. So I may have given myself this kind of advice, because in a situation where a lot of things are organized incorrectly and unprobiously, and it's difficult to go straight ahead, sometimes it's necessary to integrate yourself into the system in order to more effectively influence the process. In my opinion, this is the way our president went. You cannot deny him wisdom. I believe that he entered the system, since it is pointless to resist it, in order to change it from the inside. So he enters the system of global governance over humanity, not in order to obey, although during the first time period, he showed himself to be like them. Well, yes, I am the same as you, you have billions, I have billions, you have yachts, I have yachts. But then everyone saw that he was a little different. So sometimes one has to be cunning. After all, it's very difficult to fight evil. To fight with an open visor, this is even more difficult. Sometimes you need to make some compromise. But having a rigid core within yourself and understanding why you are doing it, that is, for the future Blago, you do it. Well, in the rear of the Germans, people loyal to us served Germans in order to do something for the motherland. They did what they could. You also governed both a pasta production factory and a poultry farm. This is the path of you as a governor. So, if you return to that time, what advice would you give yourself? Everything that happened with the five major projects happened at the level of Dobrius accidents. I attribute this to support from above because the situations were seemingly absolutely insoluble. Therefore, my main advice is this, to know and understand that you can always get support from above. And sometimes, of course, you should trust people less for their articulate words. I've had a lot of experiences when I transferred my qualities to those with whom I worked and over-entrusted. 
And sometimes they simply set me up. Sometimes they let me down very seriously. You can't be simple in a bad way. You have to be simple in a good way. Sometimes I lack this understanding in order to evaluate all the cynicism and possible danger. And then those people created such problems and such events happened that developed in an absolutely unbelievable way for me, in a negative way. These were the experiences I had. You often talk about support from above. Who do you think gets the most of it? Who is this businessman who receives more of this support from above? I think that support from above is realized exclusively and only according to nerviousness, spiritual guidelines of a person. There are no other ways. How pure his thoughts are and how much his activity correlates with God's providence, dabro, praviousness, because ultimately God is love, praviousness, dabro of a person towards himself, his children, his family, others, his country as a whole. Only this way, in my opinion, can a person get support from above. There are no other criteria. We see people who are completely sincere in their doings, in their actions, in their deeds. But this sincerity is based on a tough egoistic attitude towards everything. At the same time, these are people who create a lot, succeed a lot, and are very rich. I'm sure that any entrepreneur would ask you this question. How so? There are people who have no dobronravisness in our understanding, but they get promoted, for instance. They are, yes, very sincere, but at the same time very egoistic. The fact is that within the framework of God's allowance, a lot is done. Because God's allowance is great, one considers this to be Dabro, and the other considers that to be Dabro. In reality, there are objective Dabro and objective evil in creation. In order to reveal this Dabro, a person is gifted, in addition to the five senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste, a sense of measure and a sense of distinction, criterion. If a person is gifted with distinction from God, or if he has cultivated this in himself, then he clearly distinguishes precisely in accordance with this objective matrix. And for him, Dubro is what is really Dubro, and evil is what is really evil. And if his sense of distinction does not work, then a person subjectively considers Dubro what is in reality objective evil. In addition, we are all endowed with a sense of measure from God. The wealth of honor, Dobrius, as Dirjavin said, this is about the sense of measure. Every one of us has this sense of measure, but later we can drown it out. Therefore, those who have lost the sense of distinction, the sense of measure, live within the framework of God's allowance, and you will not find among them such people who will be happy at the end of their lives. They will sooner or later face this boomerang effect. Pushkin spoke about this in the following way. The human mind is not a prophet but a conjecturer. It cannot foresee chance, that powerful and instantaneous instrument of providence. And Anatoly Franz said, chance is perhaps a pseudonym for God when he did not want to sign. Therefore, I would advise Malnravia's people to pay attention to the fact that if they look at the life of tens and hundreds of people with certain raviousness, then they will see that sooner or later all malnravious people come across the majesty of chance. And these people don't correlate it to anything. They say, how come? He lived such a happy and successful life, earned billions, and then he came across this chance. They say this happened to him by chance, by accident. But if you look at who bad accidents happen to, look at the categories of people. It turns out that they were bankers, billionaires, and other malnravious ones. This is a procedure of social hygiene, from which it's difficult to escape. Sooner or later it gets malnravious people by measure of their malnraves. This procedure is implemented by the mechanisms of God. Although for a very long time a person can live within the framework of God's allowance, but many may think that this is an example to follow.
In fact, the moment of the exhaustion of God's allowance by that person has not yet come. When you have to make a very important decision, and you understand that a lot depends on it, how do you enter the state of making this decision? What do you do? How do you make such a decision? Indeed, any solution always has a lot of alternatives, and it's very difficult to find a mechanism that would suit all occasions, cases. This is always a certain element of uniqueness, and it's always connected, firstly, with a serious personal analysis of the situation when you need to stay awake at night, count, think. Sometimes you need to carefully consider what comes in the morning, in a dream, after waking up. These are intuitive insights. Of course, when making a decision, one must be guided by the fact that decisions cannot be made if they are made in a hurry. All wise decisions ultimately take shape. In other words, a person should try to find the variant that will mature itself. There is no other way. It's necessary to bring the situation to the moment when all doubts are already somewhere behind, and the necessary variant that the person needs will manifest itself after conversations with trusted people and after a deep study of the situation. Have you recently had situations where you had to at least partially reconsider some of your profound views? The most dangerous thing that threatens a person is marginality. When he builds certain boundaries and says, well, I know everything, I understand everything, now I can go and tell everyone, teach everyone. It is in this position in which a person ends, dies as a social and spiritual being. Therefore, I am very far from such a position that I understand everything, I know everything, that I can already write about myself with a capital letter. Absolutely not. You have to change your mind a lot, rethink a lot, change your views, and finally find mistakes in your doings. Is there an example? For the last few years, with great difficulty, I've begun to look at food differently. Thank God I handled the problem with alcohol quickly enough. As soon as I was given to understand that alcohol is a tool of governance, since then I have not been drinking alcohol. It's 25 years already. It would be crazy for me if I or my children or people close to me take alcohol during our lives. A sip of beer or a sip of champagne. This is the most unimaginable situation for me. As for food, I understood that there was something out there, but only later I figured out the origins of the problems concerning food. After all, it turns out that at the beginning of the last century, one of the sons of William Rockefeller came up with a very good idea that he could create a business, the coolest business in the world, before which the oil business would not resist. This is a business based on the health of people. William himself first sold pharmaceuticals against cancer. It was a mixture of diuretics and oil, and he sold a bottle for $25 so he could make good money. But he often changed his name and places of living, and thus he succeeded. But his son did it very cunningly. He set an objective to unite the food, chemical and pharmaceutical industries into a single complex. And when I realized this, when I understood this, you know, before I did not fully understand it. I agreed that eating meat was not good for the health, but only later I realized that it's not about being not good. It's a matrix that is deliberately built against me personally. And then I got angry and said, no, guys, you won't sell me with this anymore. It's already been more than a year since I've been eating raw food, and I have felt completely different. All those health problems that are considered normal and typical of my age have disappeared. Before the doctors told me that all my health problems came up because of my age, that it was time for them to come up, I managed to get out of the nutrition matrix only through a worldview insight, an epiphany, when I realized that it's a global system if a person does not eat meat, then it's much more difficult for him to get sick, as opposed to if he does eat meat. This is a very serious issue. A person has to eat what is necessary for him. By the way, nowadays there are many programs on television where they fry, boil, roast meat. A person eats food with additives which lead him to take pills, 
But there is still not a single pill that would not give rise to some other diseases. It's like head and shoulders. There is not a single shampoo that does not generate the need for another shampoo. If you buy shampoo against hair breakage, then you will get dandruff and you will have to buy anti-dandruff shampoo. So you will have another problem. That is, this is a long ago, properly considered scheme, where people are led around the circle. This also concerns food. There is no other way out of the circle except for worldview insight, epiphany, when a person realizes that this is an enclosed snare. What do you think? Those entrepreneurs who, in a certain way, are close to your views on life, who have a close to yours world understanding, worldview, do they need to unite into some structures, create some kind of associations, not industrial ones as chambers of commerce do, but ideological ones? I believe that today we are missing out on tremendous opportunities. That is, there really exists a matrix, and to come out of this matrix is possible only with the whole world together. Alone it is very difficult to do. And in this sense, the platform of your magazine, for example, seems to me the most fertile for the formation of the matrix of the future in all respects. This concerns humanness, this concerns business and so on. I met a lot of your people. They somehow grasp many things on the fly. They have it. They just might not have comprehended everything properly. This is because of their age, I would guess. Success is concluded precisely in this. This is the mission that I am engaged in today. For me today, enlightening work is like a breath of fresh air. When I see a person transforming literally in six months and coming to me with tears of gratitude in his eyes, and there are hundreds of such people, they write letters to me or they come to me from very far corners of our country and even other countries. They say, Viktor Alexievich, only thanks to you, this and that happened in my life. I don't give any abstruse things. I just give elementary things. If you do it alone, but not with the whole world, you will succeed. Most importantly, as I have already said, today we underestimate the capabilities of ordinary, dobrious people. After all, how did Jawaharlal Nehru change India in due time? He changed India by simply gathering ordinary people, women. There were also salt marches and other things. Why do we have something foreign? Let's eat our own. That's it, and he changed India. It is the same with us. But we, unlike those times, possess a far more powerful weapon in the good sense of the word. These are internet technologies, computer technologies. That is, today, it is possible to unite everything and everyone, first of all, on the principles of Dabro, previousness, and reasonable consumption. Our slogan should be, reasonable consumers of all countries unite. And reasonable consumers, after all, they themselves are producers. Only these producers and consumers must find each other. And today's computer technologies allow solving this task absolutely without problems. Actually, I see the main value of our conversation precisely in this. To attract the attention of all thinking people. Guys, well, let's organize our own life. Today, thanks God, no one interferes with us. Viktor Alexeyevich, thank you for the conversation. I wish the best of luck to all those who watch this video. All the best.